it's okay. We don't even need to test it. It's that okay. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, good. Great. Great. Thank you. Well, I'm happy to share um, some results with you folks today. Um, today I'm sharing the work of one of my graduate students, and so I have her photo right front and center here. Um, that's Caitlin Ord. She's um, busy submitting a manuscript today, which is a very exciting day indeed. Um, and so I'm happy to be here in her place. Um, so the work I'm going to talk about today is a piece of the work we've been doing in my lab, um, looking at strawberry production and extending the season uh, for strawberry harvest here in the Northeast. And this is part of a much bigger project across many states and even we have some European partners uh, called Tunnelberries, uh, funded by um, the USDA Specialty Crops Research Initiative. So that has lots of projects, but um, components, but our piece is looking at low tunnels and strawberries. So um, the work that Caitlin's been doing for the past couple years is really focused on looking at some tweaks to the strawberry production systems that are typically used here uh, in New Hampshire. Particularly, she's interested in day neutral varieties and uh, the practice of using low tunnels. So these are both practices that can enable the fruiting season to be much longer than it is typically. Um, here in New Hampshire. So typically here in the whole nor Northeast, the, the standard variety, strawberry production system uses day neutral varieties in this system that's called matted row production. So this is a system where um, the plants are typically managed for at least one, but usually a couple or more years of production, mulched with straw, and the varieties used in the system are June bearing cultivars. So they are not day neutral. Uh, they set their flowers in the fall and they have a very short three-week production season in late June to early July. So um, it's really typical to celebrate that season, but it's very short. Consumers' interest in strawberries does not end, however, when strawberry season ends here in New England. And so our uh, marketing uh, venues and our growers are taking advantage of that demand by bringing in day neutral strawberries grown elsewhere. Um, it's very typical to see Canadian strawberries who um, that are grown in climates very much like ours but they're using different varieties to extend that season. So the way they're doing that, and this is a picture um, that we took in Quebec when we were uh, visiting some strawberry production up there, is by growing day neutral varieties. So these varieties um, are different uh, in that they set flowers all season long. So they fruit the first year they're planted. You don't have to wait a year. They fruit within 10 weeks and they fruit all through the fall until the growing season ends. So you can feasibly get about four months of continuous production. Of course, you don't get the yields all of a sudden at high quantities in three weeks. You get them um, meted out slowly over a longer period of time. Um, the particular variety that we've used in all of our trials is a day neutral variety called Albion, which has uh, quite good fruit quality. Um, it, you would be hard pressed to determine that it was really, or differentiate it from June bearers. Um, they're really quite flavorful um, and quite attractive fruits. <coughs> Um, Kaylin did a trial this year, um, just for the first time, we haven't repeated it yet, looking at the array of varieties that are out there, um, day neutral varieties, and this is an assortment of them, and uh, I think you can maybe see they, they do just look like strawberries, but um, in fact, <laughs> if you have an eye for these things, they really do have some really different fruit characteristics, they have very different flavors, um, and they have, uh, as you'll see in a moment, Moment, some really different production seasons. Albion really is the standard in the region, and which is why she used it for the low tunnel experiments, but I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the reason sh we were both really interested in looking at different varieties is that um, 
they have the potential to fit different growers situations here so what this graph is showing is um, the yield in pounds per acre over the season this is starting in late June all the way to early November and um, these look like just perhaps a, a jumble of lines, but I want to point out that um, Albion and Monterey are these purple and gray lines that really have um, sort of a production all season long until they're ended by frost. Um, the Formerly, the standard variety seascape is shown in green here, and it really has sort of this bimodal curve where it has a chunk of quite early uh, fall or late summer production, but then a tremendous dip, and if you're lucky enough to get a late season, you might get another crop. Um, whereas something like aromas, you don't get much in the early season, but you get, that's the orange line here, you get a pretty good late season. So we see quite a variation in uh, production patterns. So focusing in on Albion, there's good reason to, uh, to think of changing and starting to adopt day neutral cultivars. So Caitlin found um, that over her production season, and this is without low tunnels, um, in 2016, she got nearly 11,000 pounds to the acre in her trial plots, and um, she got nearly 15,000 pounds to the acre in uh, 2017. And that's compared to a New England average of just about 5,000 pounds per acre for a standard June-bearing cultivar. Mind you, this is over a long period of time, uh, but it's uh, quite a bit higher yields. And these are quite low yields. In 2016, um, we experienced some major insect problems which dramatically decreased our yields. And so it's reasonable to expect yields of 20,000 pounds to the acre or more. So there's real potential to increase your uh, harvest yields with less labor using these day neutral varieties. So even though we get a really nice long growing season with day neutral varieties, uh, they are not immune to all the various things that happen to strawberry fruits in the open environment, uh, whether that be hail or um, all the sorts of rots and damages that come from exposure to rainfall. And so the other aspect of uh, this project is looking at ways to protect fruit and increase fruit quality using low tunnels. Um, the rationale for this is that they, while they are an infrastructure cost and they do represent some expense, um, they're much less expensive than high tunnels. Their short stature makes them suited for strawberry production. Um, and we're not really uh, doing worldwide innovation here. We're learning from what other parts of the world have done. Um, about 70% of the strawberry production in France is done under low tunnels. And that's true also in many parts uh, of the world. There's a lot of low tunnel strawberry production because it reduces some of the risks associated with producing a high quality crop in the open. So in the literature we see lots of reported positive effects of low tunnels. We see less disease pressure and fruit rots. We see um, an even longer production season into the fall. We see higher marketable yields. We see suppressed runner production, and without going into details, runners are something we have to remove, so that actually saves labor potentially. And we see improved fruit size um, and quality in low tunnels. So there were lots of reasons to look at this in our region and see whether they were a possible thing, uh, possible technology our growers should be taking advantage of. So in Caitlin's work, um, she had um, this lovely replicated trial looking at different kinds of tunnel systems and uh, used just the single variety Albion and measured marketable yield, unmarketable yield, percent marketable yield, and a lot of other traits as well, such as fruit color and flavor and so forth. But I'm going to really focus on the yield results today because we don't have a ton of time. So basically, to jump right to the point, low tunnels did not increase marketable yield. So um, these are 2016 and 2017 results. Uh, this is no low tunnel, 
no low tunnel compared with uh, different types of low tunnels. So this is a, uh, these are two different kind of plastics. And uh, these are three different kinds of plastics here. And so you can really see there was not an increase in uh, the marketable yield. Um, so that was a little surprising to us. You'll see why in a moment. Um, we did see a significant difference in unmarketable yield. So outside the low tunnels, we actually found significantly higher cull fruit that needed to be removed from those plots um, and measured. So we did definitely see that. It was interesting, and both Caitlin and I were very surprised to see that there weren't significant differences in the marketable yield because uh, this is a photo of her August 1st harvest, and you can absolutely see big differences in the quality of the fruit uh, in low tunnel versus uh, no low tunnel, in that there's a lot more damage and um, from the eye it looked like less marketable fruit, but it didn't hold up. So one of the things that, one of the vagaries with doing field research is that we're dependent on the weather and we've had two drought years in which uh, these trials have been done. And so we really didn't have a lot of rainfall through these growing season, which is where you would expect low tunnels to really shine. And um, we did have one rainfall in the end of October this year in which, um, Caitlin had uh, several kinds of tunnels, and one of them is made of a very thin plastic, which is able to be dropped all the way down on either side. The thicker plastics are just overhead. They're not dropped all the way down. And uh, this is the no low tunnel. So we're looking at percent marketable yield. And what you can see is that if we do have rain events, the marketable yield just after that is much higher in tunneled uh, in tunneled berries, whether they're uh, uh, just partially covered or closed up entirely. So I suspect that if we'd had rainy seasons, we would have seen a different kind of result. Um, so this is that harvest right after that rainfall, and you can see there were essentially no marketable fruit uh, in the no low tunnel and still some pretty nice looking fruit in early November under that low tunnel. So one of the things we did see, however, is that uh, the late season yield did increase. So those were total marketable yields before over the entire season. This is the late season. So this first harvest is early October to early November. This green line is no low tunnel. And these lines are uh, the low tunnel with heavy and lightweight plastics. And what you can see is that in this late end of season, especially when we started to have some precipitation, we did see an increase yield. So if we broke it down in that way, there would be a benefit potentially. Caitlin's done a lot of work on uh, looking at different ways of assembling the tunnels. Um, these tunnels are pretty straightforward. They've got metal hoops um, that can be wire, steel, PVC pipes. They have all these little um, gizmos that hold them down, little grounding stakes that keep them from blowing off and getting tangled in the woods around the field, which we don't want. We've got tie-down materials and bungees um, to hold those in place. And uh, of course, the plastic tunnel itself and then anchor objects at the end. And she's in the process right now of putting together a low tunnel uh, gun uh, to help growers sort of uh, learn from some of the mistakes that those of us working with low tunnels have been making and have learned from. So in conclusion, um, the day-neutral strawberries um, aren't for everyone because they do require management all season, unlike the June-bearing varieties. They require some extra labor. They require weekly fertigation and runner removal um, and potentially pest, pathogen, weed management throughout that entire time. But they can be really profitable because the yields compared with June bearers are much higher. We feel quite confident in that, um, in these results and lots of other published work. Um, low tunnels um, are an investment 
they require management and at this point we're just not really sure the yield benefits are there they probably are there in rainy years so if you know it's going to be a rainy year it's worth investing in low tunnels <laughs> which is a challenge um, but at this point we feel pretty confident recommending um, the use of day neutrals if they fit on farms but probably not low tunnels in all situations and that's the end of what I've got for you. I'd be happy to answer questions. It's a good question. Is there an uh, adverse effect on fruit temperature from increased, te uh, excuse me, fruit set based on increased temperature for the low tunnels? The answer is no. It doesn't actually seem that the low tunnels actually increase temperature much. We have uh, temperature sensors under all these tunnels, and because they're mostly open um, in those pictures, this is how they are most of the summer, uh, they actually provide a little bit of shading, and it's actually not hotter under there. Um, so no, we see plenty of fruit set. Um, we had, there are many different plastics um, that can be used for these and some of them block UV and some of them allow UV uh, wavelengths to get through. We suspect there may be some effects on um, pathogen development and possibly insect behavior, but no, we didn't see any effects on either temperature or fruit set or color um, or flavor, yeah. Nita. Are you planting new plants every two years, every year? Yeah, so in these systems with the day neutrals, um, the typical procedure would be, in most production areas, would be to plant in the spring, start harvesting in late June, July, and finish that growing season, and then pull them out. In New England, most growers that are using day neutrals save them over winter and get another June crop out of them and then pull them out. So they're really getting two crops but not managing them for a full second year. And part of the reason for that is that they're usually grown on plastic mulch and there's a lot of crown competition happening there and they can't really be maintained longer than that without decreasing fruit quality. Um, yeah. Yago. Um, you may have shown this and I know you showed yield, but did you show a graph on fruit size? Because the picture you showed seemed to be yeah. that was a huge difference in fruit size, which would translate to labor and picking and number of berries to give that yield. Was that yeah. significant as it looked? Did that hold up? Yes, it did after rainfall events, but not overall not in general yeah and so one of the issues is that um, I think a lot of that has to do with how these are managed and whether they're closed a lot or left open a lot that affects the uh, the more closed they are the more protected that environment is and the greater the, Im the greater those effects are so later in the fall we see that but in the summer new can I follow up with SWB concerns with extending the season yeah, you know, it's interesting. It's a very good question. So spotted ring drosophila was early and abundant this year. There was a lot of it. And in June bearing crops, the late varieties had SWD. Caitlin did not have SWD in her planting. And until the very, very, very late fall, we could find some fruit occasionally that would. But there was no infestation really at any appreciable level. And the reason we attribute that to the fact that she was clean harvesting, because she was collecting every cull fruit and removing it. There was no breeding happening. And so it was a great illustration of exquisite sanitation actually managing this pest that should have been a problem and it wasn't a problem. Um, but I kept thinking it would be, but it wasn't. So if you can clean out every fruit, you're golden. Most people aren't gonna do that, but grad students, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Grad students and, and undergraduates. And undergraduate helpers, yes, it's true, it's true. Yeah, thanks.